Hello, everybody, and welcome to Space Week Live for Sunday, June 20th, 2021. Uh, hot on the tails of this morning's, or well, today's uh, spacewalk up on the ISS. Um, welcome, and hopefully I can get through this without uh, uh, it being too chaotic. <laughs> I was kind of multitasking, and so my ducks may be a little bit out of whack, but uh, mostly in a row. Uh, to just really confuse my metaphors. So again, uh, welcome and happy Father's Day to all the dads out there, including myself, uh, if one can self-congratulate. But uh, yeah, it is Father's Day in most countries, I think. So happy Father's Day. Uh, looking back at the last week, let's see. Um, on Tuesday, a... Well, first of all, let me preface by saying that as with all Space Week episodes, this is a live Q&A session. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask it in the chat. Just make sure to tag my name, at Raw Space, so that we're sure to see the question and we can gather them and I'll answer them, address them at the end. Um, so looking back at the last week, on Tuesday, uh, Northrop Grumman launched a Minotaur-1 rocket with the NROL-111 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Uh, this mission was originally supposed to launch two and a half years ago, but it was delayed uh, repeatedly, uh, reportedly at the request of the National Reconnaissance Office. So the reasons behind those delays would have been unknown, or classified, not, publicly, uh, not public information. But uh, the launch was successful, and let's check it out. Minus ten. Five mark. Four. Three. Two. One. Flight facility in mid 
So Minotaur 1 is a um, a rocket that was developed yep it takes off like a like a shot. Uh, it is a solid fueled rocket that is uh, derived or actually it's uh, basically put together f from parts using parts from old Minuteman uh, ICBM missiles uh, you know nukes that were decommissioned and repurposed to be uh, it will into an orbital launch system. So, um, pretty cool idea, taking uh, uh, weapons of war and turning them into uh, tools of, of uh, you know, science and industry. Uh, then on, let me get back to my notes, let's see, on Wednesday, the U.S. conducted Spacewalk number 74 in support of ISS uh, installation, maintenance, and operations. Uh, it's the 239th ISS spacewalk overall. But um, uh, spacewalkers Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Pesquet from France uh, spent 5 hours 57 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, not 5 hours 57. The overall uh, spacewalk time was... Uh, I think about seven hours, but in any case, um, they the objective of the spacewalk was was to install the first of two uh, IROSA solar arrays. These are ISS rollout solar arrays that were delivered to the space station a few weeks ago by a uh, SpaceX Cargo Dragon spacecraft, uh, tucked up tucked away in the trunk. These two Irosas were tucked in the trunk of, of Cargo Dragon. And uh, they were successful. Well, they had some issues with uh, Shane's uh, space suit. First, there was a, a loss of data on the display control module, or DCM. Uh, so they actually sent uh, Shane Kimbrough back to the airlock to do a warm restart on the suit, basically rebooting the suit's computer. Uh, without having to go, you know, without having to come back through the airlock and, uh, uh, you know, deep repressurize and all of that. But they did a warm restart on the suit, uh, which was successful, and he was able to go back out to the work site at the end of the P6 truss on the port side of the, uh, uh, of the space station. Uh, there was also a momentary spike in pressure readings from Kimbrough's suit sublimator, uh, which resulted in some delays. So that there was actually over an hour of delays from these suit issues that they were having with, with Kimbrough's suit. And uh, as a result, they, well, and there was, a, there was another issue. Once they mounted the IROSA on the, uh, the mounting adapter on the 2B channel of the, uh, 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 of the space station, which is the um, upper leftmost or the, the front leftmost solar panel on the space station, uh, they, in order to unroll the IROSA, uh, they first have to unfold it. So it, it comes folded in half, they have to unfold it, and then it can roll out. Well, uh, it, they couldn't get it unfolded because there was a, part, a piece of the, uh, I think it was a bolt, uh, there was some piece of the uh, mounting adapter that was actually in the way. So they physically couldn't um, uh, couldn't unfold the thing, and because of the other delays, they ran out of time, and so they were not able to accomplish everything that uh, uh, they had hoped to. Uh, but uh, they did they did pick that up later, which I'll get to uh, in a minute. So each IROSA will add about 20 kilowatts of power to the space station's. Uh, power generation capabilities, um, and once all six IROSs are eventually uh, delivered to the station and installed, they will increase the station's power output by about 30 percent. And they're even though, so they're they're installing six IROSs, but there are eight uh, primary. ISS solar arrays. So there will be, in the end, there will be two solar arrays that do not have the new 
uh, iroses uh, deployed on top of them. Um, and by the way, this video you're seeing is sped up by a factor of two. So if they look a little, a little squirrely, that's why. <laughs> Uh, then on Wednesday, actually also on Wednesday, because that was Wednesday, uh, China had a big day. They launched on a, on a Long March 2F, uh, lifted off from Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in the remote Gobai Desert of northwest China with Shenzhou-12 carrying three Taikonauts, those are the Chinese astronauts, to the Tiangong Space Station, which currently just consists of the Tianhe Core Module, and a docked Tianzhou uh, cargo spacecraft, which arrived a few weeks ago. But here's the launch. So, um, the, uh, the Shenzhou crew module is structured similar, it's similar to the uh, Soyuz crew module, but it's um, more roomy inside, but it's a similar design, and you can see the, astro the uh, Taikonauts are sort of crammed in there a little bit. Uh, now, if we jump to the next video, this shows uh, the docking, and this is accelerated by a factor of two. Yes. But here we can see the docking of the craft, which was also successful. And that actually looks rendered, but that's a real image. They had a pretty good camera on there. So there was soft capture, and then they see they they use their their pointy stick, their button pushing stick, just like on a Soyuz. Um, and then finally, uh, the crew boarding, the three crewmate uh, crew members boarding the uh, Tianhe module from their uh, Shenzhou spacecraft. Nice and roomy inside. Tianhe One is a is a pretty large module. So congratulations to China. This is a big achievement. They have had Taikonauts in space before. This is actually China's third space station, but it's their first uh, sort of modular and and semi permanent space station. Station similar to uh, ISS, the, uh, the Tiangong Space Station (TSS) is. Um, is what China will use uh, into the future for their space laboratory and and whatever operations. Um, you know, previously they had Tiangong One and Tiangong Two, uh, which were temporary sort of laboratories, test uh, test articles, if you will. All right. Then on Thursday, space uh, SpaceX Falcon Nine launched another new. New generation of GPS satellites, the GPS-3 SV-05, into medium Earth orbit, uh, about 12,500 miles from Earth, or about 20,000 kilometers. Here's the launch. Beautiful launch and um, completely successful mission. Had a long coast time because they were headed for uh, medium Earth orbit rather than, <coughs> excuse me, rather than uh, the usual low Earth orbit that we that we see most, uh, either low Earth or geosynchronous transfer orbits, which we see uh, most of the time. Uh, 
I love these rocket cam downward facing uh, views. Uh, thanks to Noah, I guess, for uh, authorizing that. I know SpaceX had some issues a few years ago with um, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association disallowing them from having, uh, from broadcasting this rocket cam footage for, because of some federal regulation or other. Now uh, we got a real treat uh, on this launch because um, we got what is possibly the best uh, landing footage out of all SpaceX launches. We actually had continuous, um, unbroken uh, first stage cam footage all the way from fairing separation through uh, to the landing, including uninterrupted footage from the drone ship, which is uh, y we occasionally get, but the combination of uninterrupted footage from the, uh, the rocket and from the drone ship is really something special, and so I wanted to play that for you. I'm going to start it out because it's, it's fairly lengthy. I, I want to start it out at two times speed, and then once it uh, approaches landing, I'll go ahead and slow it down to uh, regular speed so that you can see. Camera showing successful fairing deploy. This Falcon 9 is passing through 110 kilometers altitude. Now we will be attempting to retrieve these new fairing hounds with the help of our contracted recovery vessel, HOS. That would be uh, John Innsbrucker, the, the chipmunk. <laughs> now, currently, Falcon 9 second stage heading northeast along the US coast. We are sending telemetry down through the SpaceX Bermuda ground station. Okay, continue to follow now, as we pass four minutes and 20 seconds into flight, all systems are go. As Falcon 9 carries GPS into space. So if you're not already familiar, on the left side we see the, uh, uh, the Falcon 9 first stage, um, which is, has separated from, from the upper stage. The upper stage you see on the right is uh, currently undergoing a, a long uh, burn on its way toward medium Earth orbit. And oh, we did actually, they did actually interrupt the, the first stage view there for a couple seconds, but... Uh, uh, here we go. So it's reorienting itself, sort of um, uh, butt end forward toward the uh, the landing location. And it's about to engage in its uh, entry burn. Now entry burn will start in just a few seconds. Here, listen to the call out. Stage one, flight termination system is safe. Stage one, entry burn has started. You heard the call out. You can see on your screen, stage one entry burn has started. This burn lasts about thirty seconds. Stage one entry burn shut down. We did have a successful stage one entry burn there, and now while Falcon 9 makes continue to follow nominal trajectories. While Falcon 9 makes its way back to Earth, you may notice that there are different soot markings, soot markings on the outer covering of the rocket. You can maybe just see them on your screen on the left there. Now, if you've ever wondered how these markings are formed, the soot is generated when the carbon-based rocket grade kerosene, or RP1, burns. And since our reentry occurs engines first, the booster flies through its own plume, which deposits the soot on the rocket there. Now coming up next will be our landing burn, which will be at T plus eight minutes and seven seconds. This will also last about 30 seconds, and it will uh, hopefully land our first stage on our drone ship. Just read the instructions. Stage one is transonic. Off the Atlantic coast. You heard the call out that stage one is now transonic. Stage two is under terminal guidance. Now just one second after the start of the landing burn, we will actually have second engine cutoff. Stage on two flight termination system is safe. On the second stage on the right. So both coming up in just a few seconds here. Stage one landing burn is started. See that stage one entry burn, Seco one. La landing burn, and Seco one. There's the first stage coming in. Landing legs are deployed. I'm on a parking orbit. <laughs> and as you can see, a little bit of little bit of uh, asynchronous or uh, unsynchronization. Uh, between the rocket cam and the drone ship cam. Uh, we can also see the shadow of the rocket there, which is pretty cool, uh, like a sundi sundial. But uh, yeah, that, that footage was really, uh, really a treat. Uh, then on Friday, Uh, China had another launch, a Long March 2C rocket launched the ninth group of three Yaogan 30 
classified remote sensing satellites, <coughs> basically spy satellites, uh, as well as the commercial Tianqi-14 satellite, which is part of uh, Guodian Gauke's plans for a low Earth orbit narrow band Internet of Things constellation. Um, let's check out that launch. good sound on that one. Uh, and then finally, this morning, uh, Sunday, starting at uh, 6.30 in the morning, Eastern Time, was the second spacewalk uh, of the IROSA installation series. Uh, so Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Pesquet went back out there, and um, uh, because they were unable to unfold the first IROSA the, uh, during the first spacewalk. That's what they uh, started out with in this second spacewalk. They, f they fixed the, uh, you know, removed the bolt or whatever. They, they fixed the situation with the, uh, the first IROSA on the 2B power channel. They were able to get that unfolded and they actually uh, deployed, they rolled out the solar array uh, during the spacewalk, which I thought was pretty neat. <clears throat> A lot of times, uh, the spacewalkers, you know, a lot of times spacewalkers will prepare a system uh, to be, you know, turned on or deployed or whatever. But it won't actually, they won't actually uh, deploy the system or, or turn it on until after the spacewalk is done. But this time we actually got to see the live rollout, which was really neat, uh, which I think I have here for you. Um, hopefully, this is the right timestamp. He had, he removed like a a retention bolt, and uh, the IROSA just rolled itself out. Or you can see it start moving. So it starts out. That that side channel is interesting. It starts out flat, but then it sort of curls up into a U shape, I guess, providing. A, uh, the ri a rigid structure, a semi-rigid structure on either side to hold the panel in place. But this is sped up two times, um, but you can see it just kind of roll itself out there. And so ultimately the um, the IROSA is, uh, what is it, 60 feet long? It's, it's pretty long. It, it's about half as long as the original solar array, and you can see it's about half as wide as well. But they're modern, more efficient uh, solar panels, and uh, they will boost the power generation of the space station by about 30% uh, when all is said and done. Really cool to see that deployed. So, uh, now they did actually, they also had an issue today, again, with Shane Kimbrough's spacesuit. I don't know what, what's the deal with his, with his uh, suit, but um, uh, <laughs> this time his helmet cam and uh, his helmet cam assembly, it, 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 including the, the camera and the, uh, the work lights, that it actually came loose from his helmet and was sort of flapping around. And Thomas Pesquet actually had to basically strap the camera assembly to uh, Kimbrough's 
uh, helmet with like um, a tether, like a tether wire. <laughs> and uh, uh, but they made it work, and yeah, you know, because in order to uh, continue working during the uh, um, during the orbital night time, uh, they have to have those helmet lights. Otherwise, they'd be looking at pure darkness. So, uh, yeah, so they had to get that secured, resecured to his head, which they were able to do. But I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll either swap out the helmet or, or find a way to resecure it for the next spacewalk, which is in a few days, which I'll get to. So looking ahead to this week, um, the first half of the week is pretty quiet. On Thursday, we have a full moon. Um, does it give the time here? Yes, it does. Uh, let's see, this will be the June 24th, uh, the full moon maximumness <laughs> will be at 2.40 p.m. Eastern, uh, 1840 GMT, and that's when the moon will be at the most full, so, um, but on Thursday, June 24th, at 8 p.m. Eastern, midnight GMT on the 25th, a uh, Soyuz rocket will launch the Pion NKS-1 spy satellite for the Russian military. Uh, the rocket will fly in the 2.1B configuration with no upper stage, taking off from Plesetsk Cosmodrome, uh, which is the northernmost spaceport in the world, uh, in the far north of Russia. And that's where they launch most of their military satellites from because it's in Russian territory. Unlike Baikonur, which was originally in Soviet territory, but is now in what is, or is located in what is now Kazakhstan. Uh, so for security reasons, they, they do most of their military launches from Plesetsk. Uh, then on Friday, June 25th, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern, 1030 GMT, is the third spacewalk to install IROSA solar arrays on the ISS. So today, uh, Shane and Toma were able to finish the deployment of the first IROSA, and they prepared the work site. They they uh, they prepared the work site at the 4B power channel location for the second IROSA, but they did not finish installing that. So that's what they're going to finish up this Friday. Uh, again, uh, like with any space spacewalk, it uh, it begins at 6:30 in the morning Eastern. Uh, well, coverage begins at 6.30 in the morning Eastern. The, the spacewalk itself is scheduled to begin about 90 minutes later at 8 a.m. Eastern and is expected to last about six and a half hours. So uh, with this third spacewalk, originally they had planned on two, but they had to do three because of the, the delays and issues they encountered. Um, but uh, this will finish the installation of the second IROSA solar array. Now, in order to install any more, first the IROSAs will need to be delivered to the ISS um, on future uh, Cargo Dragon shipments, which um, I'm not sure about the dates of those, but, uh, but they're coming up. So in the next few months, we're going to see more IROSAs installed. Uh, then on, let's see, also on Friday at 2.56 p.m. Eastern, 18.56 GMT, a SpaceX Falcon 9 will launch Transporter 2, a rideshare mission de delivering small sats for numerous commercial and government customers into sun-synchronous low-Earth orbit. Uh, then on Sunday, June 27th, and you can't see it on this week view, but if I go to the next week, maybe? There. <laughs> on Sunday, June 27th, at 12 p.m. Eastern, 1600 GMT, uh, about three hours before uh, Space Week. Uh, coverage is coverage of the release of the Northrop Grumman SS Catherine Johnson Cygnus cargo craft from the ISS. So they're going to release the Cygnus cargo craft uh, loaded with trash, basically. Uh, trash and waste and, and stuff that they no longer need. You know, um, old equipment that they're disposing of. It's going to... Um, Unbirth, be unbirthed from the station uh, that is unbirthed, not undocked, because Cygnus uh, does not have an autonomous docking capability. It has to be connected to or berthed and disconnected from or unbirthed from the station using the Canadarm2 robotic arm. Uh, 
Anyway, it's going to disconnect from the station and then um, deorbit and burn up over the Pacific to uh, dispose of that um, that stuff. But um, that is about it for the coming week. I would like to take a moment to heartily thank and welcome uh, new channel members this week, Carl Baker and David Curson. Uh, thank you. And I'll put members in the chat for you to uh, uh, take a look at. Uh, now let's get to your questions. All right. Do, do, do. 613. All right. So I'll have to scroll through the chat, see if there are any more questions, but uh, it's looking kind of light this week, which is all right. Uh, Mark Desaire asked, why do the Chinese give their rockets, capsules, stations, etc., quote unquote, heavenly names? Um, that would be more of a cultural question, and I wouldn't be prepared to uh, provide an answer because I know nothing of, uh, of Chinese um, uh, cultural norms, you know, uh, just from a distance, not knowing really anything about China, it doesn't seem like they're a very religious people, but I think they're very spiritual. So, uh, I don't know that they, they do choose names that are sort of, um, sort of spiritual, heavenly and in, in, in nature. Um, you know, as opposed to sort of the typical American motif, which is like words of inspiration, like endeavor and, and perseverance and, and, uh, you know, challenger and things like that. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I don't really have a good answer for you. I apologize for that. Geraldine Brown asks, uh, did the ISS crew fix the hole on Canadarm? No, they, um, they, there was nothing the crew had to do regarding the, uh, the orbital debris impact hole in Canadarm. The, the, the debris punched a hole in the protective covering around Canadarm, but it didn't damage any of the Canadarm functionality, you know, and, um, uh, I haven't seen any indication of that, that it actually pierced the metal of the arm. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of protective, uh, uh, padding they have on the outside was punctured, but I don't think the arm itself was, was, uh, damaged in any way from that. So they, there was nothing they had to do to, um, uh, you know, to fix Canadarm. Canadarm was, is fine. It just has a hole in the padding. All right, let's see. So, all right, let me scroll up a bit. Um, I did see a question somewhere. Where did it go? Oh, MVM Motovlog Music asked, do you think SpaceX is already using Starlink? Uh, do you mean on where? On, uh, on the drone ship or on, um, uh, on, on a Starship? I mean, they tested a, star they tested a Starlink terminal on Starship uh, previously. Uh, I'm not sure what the results of that were. But uh, uh, who knows whether they've they've uh, tried installing Starlink on the drone ship? I mean, uh, probably not because um, you know adding new parts and components to um, a mission critical you know piece like drone ship. I mean, like the drone ship is not something to be done on a whim. I mean. They would need to, you know, for example, make sure that um, that the Starlink terminal didn't had no chance of potentially interfering with the uh, avionics of the of the incoming rocket or or um, you know anything like that. Um, 
and it could be that this that the Starlink terminal wouldn't gain them anything over their existing satellite uplink. I mean, they've already got a satellite uplink on on the drone ship, so um, I don't know. But uh, uh, so they haven't, to my knowledge. But uh, my knowledge is very limited because I don't have an insider's view into uh, into SpaceX. But my guess would be that they have not um, incorporated Starlink into you know the drone ship or whatever because. Um, if that's what you were talking about, uh, for a number of reasons, including, um, you know, making changes to mission critical production systems. Um, scrolling, scrolling. Okay, uh, Mark Desaire says he thought he thought he thought the Starlink system was already active. Yes, Starlink itself is. So I could have totally got your question uh, wrong. I mean, I, I if you meant is there Starlink internet service yet? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I have it on my phone. Um, you know, for my hundred thousand subscriber uh, special live stream, I did a live unboxing and installation of uh, my Starlink terminal because I'm a subscriber to their beta service um, and it does you know as I've said previously it, it provides me with great uh, with a great connection for browsing most of the time sometimes there are dropouts but that's expected because they're not done rolling out their system yet uh, you know not done deploying Starlink satellites uh, they're going to continue doing that for years to come um, there are what 1700 odd satellites up there uh, with thousands more to come um, I do need to get on the ball though or get with the program and uh, install my dishy install my Starlink dish uh, up by my roof line because it's still sitting out in my side yard on its tripod which is dangerous because uh, well not only is it a not an optimal location from being able to view the sky, but also it's dangerous because whenever the lawnmower guy comes and starts mowing my lawn, I have to run out there and move uh, my Starlink dish because, uh, you know, before he runs over the cable and chews it up because if he destroys that cable, I'm... I'm screwed because, <laughs> because the cable is hardwired into the dish. I would need to call SpaceX and have, like, I, I might just be out 500 bucks for, for, you know, a new dish. Or maybe they might, I don't know, they might uh, send me a replacement or something for shipping, maybe. But uh, it would be bad. So I definitely want to get st my Starlink dish off the ground and up in a more secure location. Um So, oh, Preproto pre, pre says he thought Starlink was the reason the drone ship was not breaking up anymore. Uh, that is possible, but I, I don't know for sure. So I couldn't speak on that with any authority. Uh, Elmo Jones Music Orpheum asks, do you think the Chinese will be transparent about data gathered from their Mars mission and from their new space station? Um... Moderately, maybe. Uh, I think that uh, you know China likes to keep their cards close to their chest, as it were. Uh, but you know, and I think that the information that they release is more carefully curated and and perhaps filtered than one might expect from, let's say, a NASA Mars mission or uh, you know the ISS space station. But uh, you know, I don't think I don't think they have any top secret uh, operations happening on Mars or, or on their space station. I think it's pretty much standard stuff, you know, scientific research and and systems uh, testing and things like that. Uh, it's just that um, I mean, uh, you know, NASA is like prohibited by law from collaborating with 
China. So, um, you know, what information we get is, is whatever we get. I guess we'll wait and see. But, uh, uh, Dominic Bayliss asks, how much detail can be seen from space uh, as aware of super systems? So, um, detail, do you mean like uh, on the land, like, like spy satellites and things like that? Uh, bear in mind, low Earth orbit is pretty far from the surface of the ground. You know, uh, low Earth orbit, where the like uh, the ISS occupies a fairly low orbit in the low Earth orbit space, and um, uh, even so, they are around 250 miles or 400 kilometers above the surface. Now that's a long distance from which to view something. Um, you know, which is why most of the footage we see from orbit is of sort of large-scale landforms like the Nile River Delta or Florida, the state of Florida or the Bahamas or whatever, uh, you know, the country of Spain um, versus like, you know, somebody's backyard with a swimming pool. Uh, but, I mean, obviously there are satellites up there that can view very fine details down on the ground. Uh, they're expensive and, and, you know, the the, the best of them are not are not uh, for public use. They're they're for like national reconnaissance, but um, but the the uh, the most detailed view of the ground is going to be from low Earth orbit, because uh, once you get further away, it becomes more difficult to see fine detail because you're further away. For example, geostationary uh, satellites in uh, geosynchronous geostationary orbits which are 22,000 miles away, and I, I can't be bothered to do the metric conversion right now, um, they, are, they are able to essentially hover over a specific spot on the ground because that's what geostationary orbit is. It's balancing your orbital speed with your distance from the Earth in such a way that you orbit in exactly 24 hours, which may, means that you hover, you know, if you're over the equator, you hover over the same equatorial uh, location on the ground forever. Um, but you're very far from the Earth, so it's difficult to, you know, you can get like whole, whole hemisphere views, or you can actually see about 44% of the Earth um, from 22,000 miles away but uh, not quite 50%, but uh, you're not going to see super fine details from that distance, uh, which means that spy satellites have limited uh, availability, like they, they're they constantly moving in relation to, you know, just like the ISS. It orbits the Earth every 92 minutes, and the Earth is always rotating beneath it. So um, that's why satellites in low Earth orbit uh, whether they be spy satellites or, or um, uh, commercial imaging satellites, they have passes. You know, they're, they're, they're constantly passing over uh, new areas of the Earth and taking images as they go. So you can't have, like, live, you know, instantaneous images from anywhere you want unless you have a lot of satellites in low Earth orbit to take them for you because... Um, the satellite has to be actually passing over, you know, the area where you want the picture taken. So, um, Mark Desaire says geosynchronous or geostationary orbits about 36,000 kilometers. All right. So it looks like that'll wrap it up for this week. Um, no more questions are pending. So thank you all for coming. Um, and I look forward to seeing you later this week for the uh, looks like Thursday is when things get kicked off. Actually, Friday. Gosh. Uh, no live streams until Friday because the Russian military one definitely won't have a live stream. But um, anyway, catch you, catch you later this week. And until then, keep it raw. And uh, may the Bennu be with you. <laughs> Bye for now.